This episode of New Politics was released on the 13th of May, 2023, and produced on the land of the Wangal and Wajuk people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, we look at the Budget 2023 announcement and give our analysis. Are CEOs in Australia pay too much? We speak to Rebecca Buckman about this issue. And when there's a budget, there's also a budget reply. We look at what the opposition has got to say about it. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, soporific ball. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription, but... Whether it's a subscription or whether you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a t-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. The budget was released on Tuesday by the Treasurer Jim Chalmers and there's always a strong political dimension that goes way past any balance sheets and figures that are contained in the budget. And this budget is a combination of the Labor government doing what they said that they would do during the 2022 federal election campaign, and they also said that they would take a cautious approach. And I think they're probably being a little bit far too cautious here, but they've directed funding towards some of those areas that were causing political problems. The single parent payment has been continued from when the youngest child turns eight to when the youngest child turns 14, so that's good news. Job seeker payments have been increased by $20 per week and sure that's better than nothing but it's still short of what's needed. And it's also notable for what's not in there. There was supposed to be a greater source of revenue from mining and there was a substantial increase in iron ore revenues over the last year. But the petroleum resources rent tax was meant to have been improved substantially but that's only going to raise $2.4 billion over the next four years so that's not too much. So It is a political budget, but the biggest political aspect to the budget is that it's predicting a $4 billion surplus. So that's cold comfort for the people at the lower end of the scale who are hoping to see more support for them. But it's a budget that offers a good starting point for the future rather than offering any substantial reform. Economically, it's a decent budget. Looking at it from as broadly as I can and trying to take in every point of view, The government has decided to turn the ship of state slowly. The ship of state turns slowly anyway. And I think that instead of trying to force it to turn faster, they're turning it at a rate that is probably more amenable to fixing if things go wrong. I think you're right in that it could have gone a lot more. I think somewhat disappointing to a lot of people. $20 a week in Job Seeker, sure, it is better than a poke in the eye with a broken coat hanger but it could have been more. The cautious approach probably won them the election, but I think that tends to underestimate the loathing that the last government had in the in the electorate. I think it also didn't really win them the election in the landslide that historically they would have won under different circumstances. They've only got a majority of possibly up to five seats, depending on factors that we'll discuss later. Five is okay, actually. Five is a decent number. But it should have been, historically speaking, 20. They only just scrape in on election night. Economically, though, it shows that they are very good managers. They've got stuff that they have to deal with, defence issues and other promises made, it seems. They've got stuff that they said that they would deal with. And while they've ticked the box on that, They haven't really dealt with it yet. There's another two budgets in this electoral cycle, potentially. I know that one of the major papers was saying there was a double dissolution trigger in something or other coming up. I don't think there'll be a double dissolution. I don't think the Liberal Party wants a double dissolution anytime soon. Oh, well, every government tries to set up a double dissolution trigger for itself. Yeah, yeah, it does. But I I think that in this case, uh, it's to make sure that the budget gets through so that uh, a weak, unpopular opposition will be forced to take in some of the less palatable options it has. I will say too, the media coverage has been disappointing. The endless stream of economists we used to see under Liberal Party budgets, um, and now we're going straight to political analyses. Because I think for a lot of the media, they have to admit that economically, the budget has done very well. Politically, socially, culturally, I'm not as convinced. 
But there is that media narrative that when good things happen to Labor governments, it's always because of luck or something outside of its control. And an extension of that is that budget deficits are always bad, except for when a Liberal government delivers them, and that a budget surplus is always good, except when it's a Labor government that (laughs) delivers them. So... Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it was pretty much the same sort of media narrative that played out in this year's budget. And some of the reporting was along the lines of Lucky Jim and a drover's dog could have delivered a surplus this year. And this is the first budget surplus in 15 years. But a budget surplus or a deficit is neither good nor bad. It just has to fit into the economic circumstances of the time. And the idea of the budget surplus is always promoted as some kind of economic nirvana that we'll all live happily ever after once that's been achieved. But even still, for all of the talk and rhetoric over the past nine or ten years, the Liberal National Coalition didn't deliver a surplus once in nine years. So hopefully they'll shut up about this for the time being. And during the time of Peter Costello as Treasurer, no one ever said that he was lucky, even though every surplus that he created was supported by the proceeds of the mining booms in Western Australia and Queensland for all of that time. And A lot of that was squandered on unsustainable middle-class support, which federal budgets and governments are still coping with. And what is Jim Chalmers supposed to do anyway? Is he going to say, well, sorry, I don't want to be known as a lucky treasurer, so I'm going to give all of that unexpected mining revenues back to the mining industry? Well, you know, he's not going to do that. So you do make your own luck in politics. And if Jim Chalmers is seen to be lucky in 2023, well, Peter Costello was also lucky back in the 2000s. But one thing... That is for sure. I don't think that Jim Chalmers is going to squander favourable budgets in the same way that Peter Costello did. And that's the difference. I think that Jim Chalmers has a very clear vision of how he wants to see government money spent and the budget utilised for the betterment of Australia. Now, we can argue over whether it is for the benefit of Australia or betterment of Australia, but I think that he had that vision in a way that Costello didn't have that vision. Costello wanted to be seen as a good economic manager. And instead of doing it by being a good economic manager, he tried to bribe the electorate into, and mostly succeeded, bribing the electorate into voting for them again. I think it showed at the end in that the best job Peter Costello could get was in a dying industry. Now, that's a better job than other candidates have been able to get, let's be fair. But he wasn't snapped up by global companies. And as I argued last week, I don't think he should have been. But there was talk at the time that he was, you know, he was available to talk to any prestigious global company that was willing to talk to him. And in the end, it went to Channel 9. Now, that's not to say that he doesn't enjoy it. And that's not to say even that he's not very good at it. That's a discussion for another time before you all start furiously typing at me. (laughs) But it is to say that Business recognised that he wasn't that good of a treasurer. Of course, compared to the four or five uh, Liberal treasurers after him, he was John Maynard Keynes and Adam Smith all rolled into one. And the other thing to this whole notion of is a surplus good or bad, as you rightly said, a surplus or a deficit is nothing. It is how you deal with it. At the end of the Howard years, we had very little. At the end of the Rudd years, we had avoided the GFC that ravaged the rest of the world. We had buildings that could be used. We had fuller employment than we do now. I note the Reserve Bank is arguing for a higher unemployment rate, which I think is extraordinary. Why do you want the complete inefficiency of people not working, except to pay them less? But if everybody is adding value, then who cares? We should have 100% or as close to 100% employment as you can get. You'll never get all the way there because there's always exceptions, but we should have as close to 100% and 93, 94, 95, 96, 97% just isn't good enough. What a waste. So the budget itself, it's not adventurous. All of the things that we were calling for are either not there or just in there a little bit. Funding for public schools hasn't changed and there's still that massive amount of funding for private health companies. Anthony Albanese did push that idea during the election campaign last year that he would lead a cautious government and this is probably a little bit too cautious but it does seem to be working on the things that the community needs such as the increase to Medicare bulk billing rather than the usual pork barrelling that we see in coalition budgets. Here's a short snippet from Treasurer Jim Chalmers. The budget we present to the Australian people tonight provides cost of living relief that is responsible and affordable and prioritises those most in need. It delivers historic investments in Medicare and the care economy, making it easier and cheaper for Australians to see their doctor. 
it broadens opportunity by breaking down the barriers of disadvantage and exclusion. It lays the foundations for growth by embracing clean energy and investing in value-adding industries, people, skills, technology and small business. And it strengthens the budget with a surplus forecast for this year with less debt than smaller deficits compared with recent budgets. Yeah. These are the foundations on which our government is building a stronger economy and a fairer society, with greater security in a time of economic uncertainty, more opportunities in more parts of our country, and a renewed determination for Australia to make the most of the defining decade ahead. And a lot of what he had to say does fit into that no one left behind narrative that Labor has been pushing, even if it is just tinkering at the edges for some of those people. There have been suggestions that there will be more movement on Job Seeker in the next budget, but that's still a year away. And I realise that Job Seeker is only a small part of the government spending, but the government spending does have to match up with the rhetoric that they're pushing through. And one of Bob Hawke's first acts when he became Prime Minister in 1983 was to substantially raise unemployment benefits. He didn't even wait for the first budget to do that. And with that renewables superpower narrative that Labor has been pushing as well, there, there is business support for net zero practices and there's bits and pieces here and there, but I'm not sure how you become a renewable superpower if you don't have the right policies in place to support that. But maybe, again, that's something for the next budget as well. It is possible. As I said, I've been looking at it from many, many angles. And it's possible that they're looking at this as part one of a three-stage budget to lead them into the, the next term so that everything goes up a little this budget. The next budget, generally the middle budget of an electoral cycle, tends to be a horror budget. But I'm wondering if rates will raise again next budget slowly and then, and then in the third budget just before the election, rates will raise again. And Labor has to be aware that there are people who dislike unemployment benefits for whatever reason. I've noticed the narrative of the doll bludger is creeping back in and the commercial current affairs shows are interviewing typical people trademark, often tradies trademark with a capital T, who are appalled trademark that <laughs> the unemployed have no incentive to find work because they've just put their rates up. I think someone worked out it was $2.86 a day, which used to be a cup of coffee. It's not even that now. The humiliating and terrible diary system, mutual obligations, where you have to turn up to an interview at the time they tell you whether you can or not. People have had to miss specialist appointments that they'd made months ago because they've got this mutual obligation. It's still a system that has been run and designed by bullies, essentially. And it's another priority that the Labor government has to get stuck into to make it a fair system. I'm not opposed, by the way, to people on unemployment benefits needing to show that they are actively looking for work. People on disability benefits needing to show that they are genuinely disabled. People on old age pension needing to show that they are over the age of 65. It's public money. You do need some kind of accountability, but you can do it in such a way that it raises dignity, that it is genuinely helpful, and that it makes sure that the money is being used constructively, not thrown at people in a form of disgust. And I know it's a big job, and that's why I'm wondering if we're on part one of the trilogy here, where they use the three budgets to set up a brighter and better Australia. Now, we started off this section by suggesting that budgets are usually all about politics, but this budget seems to be setting up the Labor government for the long term in office. This budget surplus is relatively small. It's around 1% of overall government spending, and it looks like it could be a one-off. The next three years are predicted to be in deficit, and as we mentioned before, it doesn't really matter if it's surplus or deficit. It's got to fit into the economic circumstances of the time. But even this one-off surplus negates that narrative about the Liberal Party being the better economic manager, and many studies have shown that this is not actually the case anyway, but it's a perception that does remain. And the Liberal Party can't keep saying, well, the Labor government's never produced surpluses. Well, here it is. Yes, they do. And this is after the Liberal National Government was not able to produce or achieve a surplus once they were in government over the past nine years. And all of this creates the groundwork for future budgets and future electoral 
rewards, I think, for the Labor government. And Labor's now starting to steal the clothing from the Liberal Party. Anthony Albanese has said that the Labor Party is now the party of aspiration, and he said that quite a few times. And I can think I can remember John Howard using those words many, many years ago. And I'm not sure if that means that the Liberal Party will now become the party of the working classes, but we are living in very strange times. Here's the Prime Minister talking about the budget. It should tell people that we're laying the strong foundations for a better future, that we're a government that takes the commitments that we took to the 2022 election seriously, that we're about implementing them, and we're a government with a sense of purpose. Uh, we want to uh, change the country for the better, and the foundations that we laid to deal with the immediate challenges of cost of living pressures that people are feeling we wanted to alleviate those pressures without putting pressure on inflation, but also always having an eye on the medium and longer term. Hence the, uh, the real transition to Australia becoming a renewable energy superpower. We want to be defined by what we're for. We are for a strong economy that creates opportunity. I said during the election campaign, I wanted to make sure that no one was left behind. Traditionally, Labor has been the party for the disadvantaged, and last night's budget reflects that. But also, no one held back. We're the party of aspiration. We're the party that understand that people want a better future for their children. And that means creating more opportunity, uh, dealing with new industries being created because of a clean energy future, making sure that we don't just continue to export our resources, but we value add wherever possible. We make more things here. So all things being equal, the Labor government probably realises that it will be in office for at least two terms, and historically that's been the case since 1931, that new governments are always given a second term, and this budget seems to acknowledge that. It's not rushing everything. It's being considered as a responsible budget by many economists and share markets, but we do have to remember that we live in a community rather than an economy, and There will be many Labor supporters disappointed with the budget and there will be a lot of people disappointed because it's not doing all the things expected from a Labor government, but I think it's a reasonable building block for the future. I think people are right to be disappointed and angry and we got some lovely correspondence from one of our listeners in which he eloquently expressed his disappointment in the budget. And I think people are right to criticise budgets, even though... Anthony Albanese stated he would lead a cautious government. People didn't want caution. They wanted a big reformist government. And this is where long-term plans can go awry. If you continue to under-deliver, and again, he hasn't. He's done exactly what he said he was going to do. And most people complain that politicians promise everything and deliver nothing. Anthony Albanese promised a cautious government. So we can't criticise him for that. He's delivered what he he said he would. But we can start to agitate for, well, maybe a bit less caution and a little bit more grasping of the nettle, as uh, Robbie Burns put it, to move forward and to move Australia away from the really the Howard years. And the budget politically, it's not very good for the Liberal and National parties. The surplus has stolen the LNP's thunder for the time being. They haven't got much to work with economically. When they were in office, they created large deficits. They left behind a large national government debt. They spent too much money in the wrong areas. So their main focus at the moment is going to be on inflation and cost of living pressures. But as bad as that might get, I don't think it's a message that you can sustain politically for the next two or three years. So all they've got at the moment is endless populist rhetoric. The Australian Greens have also attacked the budget and mainly for good reason in my opinion and some of it seems to be attacking it just because they could but budgets have to be negotiated with the senate and there are usually ambit claims for a lot of these areas which gives all political parties room to negotiate in the senate but i'd say that the greens will support most of the budget get some of the things that they're after and remembering that the government needs the support of the greens and two other senators to approve these budget measures so The budget could have been so much better for different people, but we'll be talking about something different in a week's time. So whatever criticisms there are, they'll continue in the lead up to the next budget, 12 months away. And there was also some conversation that with hindsight, the 2019 federal election was a good election for the Labor Party to lose. Now, 
Political parties never think like that. It's always better to win elections and be in government rather than lose and sit in opposition. But I did think this through, and I think there probably is a little bit of merit to this. If Labor had been in government after 2019, they would have racked up the same level of national government debt and budget deficits, and that would have fit into the public perception of the Labor Party being the party of debts and deficits. And then the theory goes that the LNP would have got back into office at the 2022 election and would now be revelling in a budget surplus and be able to say, see, we told you so, we are the better economic managers. And we still have that same mindless rhetoric that we heard from John Howard and Peter Costello for well over a decade after 1996. And of course, this is all theoretical, we'll never know because it never happened. But hopefully this debate about who's the better economic manager will quieten down over the next few years because we all know that it's not the Liberal and the National parties. I think from a public health point of view, it was a disaster that the Liberal Party won. I think we could have done a lot better with the pandemic than we did. We're still in the pandemic. There are still hundreds of people getting sick every day when there should be next to nobody by now. And I think to Australia's position in the world would be in a better place uh, looking at it geopolitically. I think we would have had a better standing. We wouldn't have had that awful AUKUS agreement, I don't think, or it would have taken a completely different shape. There's a whole lot of stuff. Scott Morrison could have enjoyed his Hawaiian holiday, for example, at least publicly. It's often a double-edged sword, being government. And yet, yeah, no, I don't think there's any prime minister in Australian history, or British history for that matter, or any American president who went in thinking, this is my plan for the next four years, and didn't have it railroaded by something completely out of the blue and, and unexpected. But... It's an interesting thought experiment. If Labor had won in 2019 under a shortened government, would things have turned out as well for them in 2022? And that's something worth pondering, isn't it? You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or you can find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. The CEO of Qantas, Alan Joyce, will be leaving his position in November and he's been in that position since 2008 and during that 15-year term he's earned over $125 million and Qantas made cumulative losses of $1.9 billion. Now most of that was incurred after COVID commenced in 2020 and he did preside over $1.6 billion in profits before that, so it wasn't all bad. But there is a perception that CEOs in Australia are overpaid, and especially at a time when wages have stagnated over the past decade. In the case of Qantas, there's been an attack on workplace rights. They sacked 6,000 workers in 2020 and also 2,000 ground crew, possibly illegally, and there's a court case at the moment to determine whether that was legal or not. It also grounded its entire fleet in 2011, and service quality has deteriorated over the past three or four years so it could be argued that Alan Joyce hasn't represented value for money for Qantas and this is an important issue to raise during budget time where there's cost of living pressures, inflation and lower wages but is it a case where CEOs in Australia are being overpaid David? I think CEOs have been well overpaid and have done since about the 1980s. Before then, the head of a company roughly earned about 10 times what the lowest paid person in that company made. So, say the part-time cleaner's on 50000 a year, and if you're a part-time cleaner and you're not on that, I'm sorry about that, <laughs> had a CEO of the company who earned about 500000 a year. Now, 500000 a year is a very, very good package. Now, I don't know what the lowest paid people at Qantas earn, but I imagine it's around 70000 75 grand a year, maybe eighty, somewhere around there. Alan Joyce was on $24 million a year. And I know a lot of that was share bonuses and not cash, etc. But he walks out 
an extremely wealthy man on hundreds and hundreds of times the wage of the lowest paid in Qantas. At some point, and it's partly Milton Friedman and those people are to blame, Ayn Rand is to blame. Ayn Rand convincing the managerial class that they were as smart as anybody else when that's not demonstrably true right across the board. Friedman arguing that CEOs have a much bigger responsibility than what is argued. It's partly an anti-Marxist thing in terms of Marx said that it was the workers who really controlled and owned the means of production. So it's this response by these virulent anti-communists saying, no, 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 it's the boss who's in charge. And wages start to creep up in the 90s, along with some other nonsense, like if you've run one company, you can run any company. And that is not true. If you started in a construction firm, say, you can't move across to retail easily without significant retraining and rethinking of your role and how the business works, for example. So it, it's a convergence of things meant that really wages were taken off people who did the work and given to people who, I would argue, don't actually do the work and certainly don't do the work of hundreds and hundreds of people. Sure, the CEO has a responsibility and may be involved in decisions that may cost jobs, may cost the company a profit, may cost his or her reputation. And so, sure, maybe they should get paid more. But the pandemic, I think, demonstrated that we don't really need a lot of CEOs. And there's also transparency issues for how all of these remunerations and packages are organised. And David, you spoke to Dr. Rebecca Buckman about these issues, and she's an academic in accounting and corporate governance from Macquarie University. And there seems to be a lot to consider in this area. I really enjoyed uh, speaking to Rebecca. I learnt a, a lot and there's a lot of food for thought in this interview. And I'm joined today by Dr. Rebecca Buckman, a lecturer in accounting and corporate governance at Macquarie University. Thanks for joining us, Rebecca. Thanks, David. Now, you've been doing some very interesting work on CEO remuneration in Australia. Would you care to tell us a little bit about that, please? We looked specifically at the cash bonus component of CEO remuneration um, because interestingly in Australia, CEOs actually still get a relatively large cash bonus, which is in contrast to some other countries such as the US where equity compensation is more common, let's say. So what we do, we take a look at all the remuneration reports and actually want to find out what are the performance conditions that these CEOs are being rewarded for. So basically, what are their KPIs? And it's interesting to see what's going on there because there's quite a variation in one, the level of transparency that firms disclose, but also the different performance targets that are actually being used. So some firms are very open about the performance targets that are being used. So they might say, oh, we use around 60% financial targets and 40%, let's say, non-financial targets. And they might say this is based on things such as profit. But then other ones are not as transparent. So they might say, we do use some non-financial performance targets. And they might say, oh, we reward for showing firm strategy or firm spirit, which one perhaps could argue, well, isn't that part of the job description, perhaps? So yeah, it's quite interesting to see what's going on there. Why do you think they've set it up this way? What benefit does it have to, firstly, companies, then shareholders and employees? Well, I think in 2011, there was a new regulation that took place. So it's commonly known as say on pay, so where shareholders actually get to vote on the remuneration package of the CEO. So it is quite important that shareholders do understand what the CEO is being rewarded for. But then some firms say that due to strategic reason or competition, that they can't disclose the information because it might give away what they're working on or which projects they're focusing on. The old uh, commercial in confidence is used to cover a multitude of sins by the sound of it, not, not just in CEO pay. How prevalent is this amongst Australian companies? At what level does it start? And is it every Australian company? Um, that's an important question. So we focus on the top 500 ASX listed firms. And there is some variation, as I said, when it comes to the level of transparency. So we actually have to kick out around two thirds of firms from our sample because they don't say anything at all. So we can't tell one, do they have a bonus in place? And two, if they have a bonus in place, what would the performance metrics be? So we don't know at all. So those ones we initially have to kick out from our sample. 
which means our main tests are focusing on around a thousand observations and this is from the year 2004 to 2018. Um, and yeah, so those are the main ones we do get to look at. And interestingly here, we find that around 40% do include a non-financial performance metric, but they don't say what that is at all. So we don't know what's going on in that specific metric. Do you have any suspicions as to why they're not reporting, apart from the official reason given? Or um, We do try to find out like what's going on. And as I said, they do mention they can't disclose this for strategic reasons, which could be very much possible. So one thing we tried to do is to look at future firm performance, because the underlying assumption here could be if it genuinely is a strategic reason and you are working on, let's say, some products that you don't want to disclose to the market ahead of time, then presumably future firm performance should increase when you have those undisclosed performance metrics. But we actually find the opposite. So we do find that firms that have these undisclosed performance metrics, on average, compared to other firms in our sample, um, perform worse in the short term, which then kind of raises some questions about whether this strategy argument is really what's going on there, or whether it is, uh, let's say, managerial power that's being influenced here. I mean, I, I suppose there's an obvious reason as to why, but why hasn't Australia put itself in line with a lot of the rest of the world with more efficient uh, CEO pay, do you think? Um, that's a good question. So it's important to keep in mind that Australian firms are significantly smaller than some of the US competitors. Then, of course, Australia has a large proportion of mining firms. So a lot of these firms are still in the exploration state, which means they don't have revenues yet. And perhaps then the share price isn't going to respond as it would for a more traditional firm, let's say. So there could be a reasonable argument made why they haven't shifted towards equity compensation. And a cash bonus, of course, in terms of preference, at least you get the immediate payoff. So you do what you have been asked to do and straight away you get your cash bonus. Whereas when it comes to equity compensation, the idea is that hopefully you're aligning compensation practices between the CEO and then shareholders, how they get paid with the share price. A cash bonus can work very efficiently. It just depends on how it's being set up. And I guess that's where we didn't know too much before because the compensation plan is quite extensive um, and quite complex. How should the system be reformed? Good question. I think the initial aspect we think is quite important is just to be transparent so that we know exactly what's going on in there. Um, as I mentioned before, around 40% of these cash bonuses are tied to non-financial performance measures. And those are very important because they can really tie in aspects that a financial metric cannot. So it's important that they're there. But Beyond that, we need to know what they actually are so that there can't be some ex post manipulation happening. And we need to have some specific metrics, even within non-financial targets. I'm reminded of Bob Hawke's comment back in 85 or 87, where he said that Australia doesn't have a world-class CEO running Australian businesses. It sounds like not much has changed. <laughs> but would it be fair to say that there's maybe some of our senior executives being overpaid? Look, that is an argument that um, I think academics continually try to explore. So the underlying idea here is that when you get paid, it should be in line with the characteristics of the firm. So you kind of get into that effective versus excessive pay. And I think the cash bonus itself has more room to be not necessarily aligned with firm performance because, as I said, those performance targets, they are a little bit all over the place. But in saying that, they have gotten better over time and reporting practices do improve significantly over that time period. So initially, our sample is relatively small, mainly because we can't observe anything as to what's going on. But then over time, they do start to get better. Has the improvement come about because there's been a change in the types of firms that have hit the top 500, do you think? Or have the old older firms just got better at it for whatever reason? Um, I think there's a bit of both going on. I'd say from the literature's point of view, Australia has relatively good corporate governance practices. So one aspect is in the US, it's quite common for the CEO and the chairman to be the same person. Whereas in Australia, that's one characteristic that we don't observe. So here, generally, the chair is a different individual. The idea here is that maybe we're able to improve independence than also 
observing a bit more. We also find that like generally independence of the board has increased over time. So the framework around all of this seems to be improving over time. Um, what we do observe is that quite a lot of CEOs, and this is around one third of CEOs in our sample, they include performance metrics specifically tied to corporate social responsibility, which of course is quite a hot topic at the moment. It's interesting to see then, does rewarding the CEO for taking action on CSR, does that actually result in real action or does that just open another can of worms that gives room for manipulation, uh, which we haven't explored in this paper, but it's something that future studies can look at. That was Dr. Rebecca Buckman, academic in accounting and corporate governance at Macquarie University. This is the new politics podcast, available at Apple and Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and Amazon Music, and you can support us at Patreon, and also find us at our website, newpolitics.com.au. So while the focus has been on the budget this week and the budget reply from the opposition, which didn't seem to have much to say in there, but the budget reply doesn't really need to have much in there at this stage of the political cycle, but we're not really getting too much of a flavour of what the Liberal National Coalition would do if they ever get back into government. But the former government minister, Stuart Robert, he's announced that he will be retiring from politics. The date hasn't been announced yet, but it's more than likely going to be sooner rather than later. He's in the Queensland seat of Fadden and Queensland is a stronghold for Peter Dutton and for the LNP. It holds 21 of the 30 seats up there and Fadden is held by a margin of 10.6% by the LNP so it will be difficult for them to lose that seat. There's also that continuous talk of Scott Morrison leaving politics as well as we discussed last week and he's actually taken up an advisory position with the Centre for New American Security and that's a smaller military think tank based in the United States and so there will be some changes coming up in federal politics in the near future. Stuart Robert leaving politics, this is a good move. He was one of the ministers responsible for robo-debt, as was Scott Morrison. And the pre-selected candidates in these seats, whenever that happens, that will give us a clearer direction for which pathway the Liberal and National Party is going to create for its own future. There was a slight glimmer of hope in that Catherine Deves was, I think, basically suggested to not stand for Jim Mullins seat. And they've got a couple of other candidates who are a little bit more moderate. So I'm wondering if there are wiser and cooler heads in the, the Liberal Party who are starting to think maybe this far right wing nuttery isn't electorally good. We've lost seven elections now. Maybe we should try something else. It will be interesting to see who they replace Robert with. I think he didn't cover himself in glory, racking up the internet bill, racking up expense bills that he wasn't entitled to, and then kicking into the poor for basically making mistakes in an extremely complex and punitive system. He won't be missed by anybody. Him and Morrison apparently fell out because Morrison threw him under the bus with the whole uh, robo-debt thing. So it, it's probably a lonely place for him in opposition with one of the few friends he had not talking to him anymore. And yeah, he's best out of politics. I would argue probably best into a courthouse somewhere to try the case. With federal ICAC starting, the suspicion is, is that he will be one of the uh, more prominent attendees. How true any of this is, it's all alleged, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but Robert won't be missed. Morrison won't be missed either. I don't think he's got any jobs coming. He's got a voluntary position with this think tank as an advisor, advising on what, I have no idea, photo opportunities, dressing up in a uniform in your best light. Washing women's hair. Getting people to shake your hand against their will. That would be a good one. Again, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think there's any jobs for him. At least Peter Costello was able to get a job. At least Josh Frydenberg was able to get a job.
I don't see the Labour Party giving Morrison a ambassadorship anywhere for all kinds of reasons. And again, I think once the NAC starts, I think we'll be hearing the name of Scott Morrison a lot more too. But as we move further away from coalition years, this budget projects that the economic numbers increasingly deteriorate. There's more spending than the government earns, and that's exactly what always gets Labor governments into, tr into trouble. We don't need 10,000 more public servants in Canberra on top of the already 181,000 public servants. Now, Labor will say anything to get into power, and once in government, they just don't follow through. Tonight, the Coalition remains focused on strengthening the economy, yeah. Yeah. making sure that our hard-working middle-class Australians can get ahead and do not become Labor's working poor, yeah. and keeping Australia safe and secure. We believe in lower taxes to allow Australians who work hard to keep more of their own money. Yeah. Now, Peter Dutton didn't really impress during his budget reply speech, but it's clear that he's still trying to speak to his base supporters and possibly trying to reach out to One Nation supporters and maybe some conspiracy theorists as well. He attacked the idea of Big Australia and immigration, attacked the increase of public servants in Canberra. He pushed the idea of lower taxes, small business support. His main three messages are also that Labor has failed on higher power prices. They've created higher unemployment and higher taxes. Now, you might be able to put in an argument about higher power prices, but higher unemployment and higher taxes, not so sure about that, unless he's talking about higher taxes on cigarettes, which is always a good tax if it discourages people from smoking. But most of this seems to be a continuation of Scott Morrison, which was a continuation of Tony Abbott, which was then a continuation of John Howard. And it's like the old dog without any new tricks. And a lot of this will appeal to a certain group of people in the electorate. They're quite happy to hear from that old dog with the old tricks. But this is the politics of yesteryear and the world has moved on. And that's not to say that it won't return at some point in the future, like it did for John Howard in 1996. But this is not the time. This is electoral poison for a lot of the people that the Liberal Party is trying to win back. And I think that Peter Dutton is giving out all the wrong messages. When you look at it demographically, it's disastrous for the Liberal Party. The under 35s, there's basically nobody voting for them. There is a very small percentage of younger voters who will vote Liberal, but it wasn't the 45% that it was in the 1980s or even the 38% that it was in the 1990s, in which meant that there was a basis to build on. As people get older and get more conservative and start to think, oh, maybe the Liberal Party. You already had a lot of people who had been voting and been members and been voting for them, that they could build on that. It might have skewed old, but it's numbers, not age, that counts. That basis isn't there. And in two or three elections, unless there's a massive change, there's no coming back. They're clearly aware of this, but how they're going to change it, I'm not sure in the short term. There's also speculation that depending on what happens with the reactions to the budget overall and what happens in the by-elections of Fadden and Cook, whenever they do actually happen, the Liberal Party is trying to shore up the deputy leader, Susan Lay, as an alternative leader. And there isn't actually a push to make her the leader right now, but just to be prepared if Dutton does resign or if things get worse. And she did go on a listening tour several months ago and this is what leadership aspirants tend to do and she's been asking more questions in Parliament question time without much luck. Can the Prime Minister, using his economics degree, explain why his government's only answer has been to announce a series of budget measures to spend more and tax more? Why do Australian families always pay more under Labor? <laughs> Well, I, I do have an economics degree, thank you, <laughs> that is leader of the, the opposition. I encourage her to remind people at every opportunity. <laughs> in case she's wondering, it was from the University of Sydney, and I can bring it in here, and perhaps she could table it and frame it and put it up in her office, in her office. Because indeed, Order. indeed I do use it each and every day. I use it to know, to know that indeed inflation had taken off well before Labor took office. Indeed, the largest quarterly rise this century was, guess when? March 2022. The largest
largest rise in inflation of any quarter this century was on their watch. Susan Lay is considered to be part of the moderate faction within the Liberal Party, even though she was a part of the Morrison Wright group when he was Prime Minister. But in politics, a party or a faction within that party, they have to be prepared for any change in leadership, even if it is as a backstop or a break glass in case of emergency type of situation. There's also suggestions that Angus Taylor has got tickets on himself as well, but he had a very ordinary week in the lead up to the budget announcement. He's far too inconsistent and does lack a bit of credibility. Here's what Jim Chalmers had to say about Angus Taylor. Angus Taylor says anyone could have delivered a surplus on this budget, (laughs) and he challenges you and says uh, the real test will be whether the budget can deal with inflation and whether it's sustainable and not a one-off. What do you say to that? Well, Angus Taylor's argument appears to be that anybody could deliver a surplus except for the Liberals in office. You know, they had nine cracks at this and went none for nine. They promised a surplus in their first year and every year thereafter and didn't deliver a single one. Now, Angus Taylor... He's not a serious person, he's not making a serious contribution, and that's why nobody takes him seriously. So it's not really the happy times in the Liberal Party at the moment, and we've been saying that for some time, and it looks like they'll have a few more electoral tests coming up over the next few months. They're in a bad place, there's no question. They've got a leader who isn't cutting through, to use that unusual phrase. They've got a demoralised front bench. And I must say, I was surprised that Susan Lay has been suggested as a leader. As we've said before, there's really nobody except for maybe Bridget Archer who could tap into the zeitgeist in a way that would make the Liberal brand electorally acceptable. Suzanne Lay, who accidentally bought a unit on the Gold Coast on a business trip that she'd need to be on, for example, these types of things don't get forgotten and are damaging. She's also not particularly liked in the wider community. And I think that's a factor. Angus Taylor, the second he formed that Cayman Island Water group, that finished him as leader of the Liberal Party, whether he liked it or not. And if there was any doubt, his involvement in the forging of travel documents about the Lord Mayor of Sydney to try and promote his own wife into the position of Lord Mayor of Sydney would have finished him just because he's not competent. It's just insanity. I think Lay is the likely candidate, but really she's just an irrelevancy because whoever's leading the Liberal Party at the moment is going to be an irrelevancy, despite what the media tell us. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. And if you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.